I'm sure that you've heard many sermons and many lectures and series on what it is to be better and to do better. And so I'm just going to add to the litany of discussions that you've already had. And I pray that the word that God has given me would do as the scripture says, that it would be a lamp to your feet and a light unto your path. So I'm told we're going to be talking about rejuvenate. Um, that is to be born again, to, to begin again, to, to do again. And I want you to look at a familiar passage of scripture. And I pray that in the familiarity of the scripture that we will still be able to see new wine. I want you to go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. 15. Here is what the word of the Lord says in Nehemiah 6. It says, so the wall was finished. That's enough to preach right there. Something that you put your hand to. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody has started something. This message is for finishers. And the wall was finished in the 25th and 5th day of the month and it happened in 52 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were surrounding us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was of God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. And the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him because he was the son in law. Listen, this is, this is so key that he was the son in law. Of Shechaniah, the son of Arah, and his son Johan had taken their daughter, Meshulam, the son of Barakat. Don't worry about any of those names. What you need to understand is that the nobles of Judah, this is key, had given a letter to Tobiah. Verse 19. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters, here it is, to put fear into them. Now, let's go to chapter 7, verse 1. I got three more verses and we're done. And now it came to pass when the walls were built and I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed. That I gave my brother Hananiah and Hananiah the rule of the palace charge over Jerusalem for he was a faithful man help me holy ghost and feared God above many last verse and I said unto them let not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun be hot and while they stand by let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watches of inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone in his watch, and everyone to be over against his house. You know, I'm down here in Houston as I am preaching to you in New York and around the world. And this has been one of those years where it has been raining almost every day. I want to talk on this subject, and you'll get it in a moment. Let's talk about weather delays. Weather delays. Right to my right, as I stand on this stage, this church is currently building a 40,000 square foot, multi-million dollar addition to the building that God has already given us. 
I can look to my right and see through the crevice and the crack in the door um, the men who are inside working as I speak to you this evening. And as I speak to you, there has been puddles of water inside of the building for days on end because it has been raining just about every day. And because of the weather, the day that had previously been given to us for completion has now been abdicated to a later time due to what the contractor calls a weather delay. And because of those delays, the construction will not meet the original deadline because God in his infinite wisdom needed the rain and the wind to do whatever it does which caused the plan that we had to be delayed. Now, delays are frustrating. Delays are costly. Delays can cause there to be distrust and mistrust between those who expect the building to be completed and those who are completing the building. Just not too long ago, I walked through there and I asked one of the contractors, what was this hole in the ground as water was coming up out of it? And he told me that hole in the ground is where they're going to put the volleyball poles so that when you have volleyball games, the pole will go on that ground. And so I walked in thinking I had knowledge and talked, walked in and to the general contractor and I said, uh, is that, that a volleyball hole? He said, no. He said, they drilled that hole as a sample to find out if the concrete was still holding its integrity because delays even cause miscommunication. Delays cause people to make up answers to questions they shouldn't even be answering. Delays are costly, especially, especially weather delays, W-E-A-T-H-E-R, weather delays. But as you saw on the screen, when they put up the topic, you will find out that we did not say W-E-A-T-H-E-R, weather delays. You would have seen that the name of this subject and the spelling is W-H-E-T-H-E-R, weather delays. It is the idea that whether it is raining, whether you are sick, whether you are frustrated, whether you are tired, it should not cause the delay of your destiny. That God is not answering to whether you have enough money. He's not answering to whether you have the connections. He's not answering to whether you feel like it. When God puts something in you, you got to do it whether you feel like it or not. Somebody say weather delays. So, so, so the wall, so the wall uh, was finished according to the text in 52 days. 52 days. Nehemiah completed the job in 52 days. I, I think that's important because by the time we get to this text, at least it was complete. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but God told me this is the year for you to complete it. This is the year for you to finish what you started, whether you have the money or not. This is the year for you to finish what you started, whether you are married or not. This is the year for you to be happy, whether you are single or not. You got to stop having these weather delays. It, the wall was complete. It had been, listen, it had been 150 years since the city of Jerusalem had walls. That means for a century plus a half, the city had been unguarded. For a century plus a half, 
the first line of defense had been eroded. For the first 150 years preceding this text, for the last 150 years, for the last six quarters, for the last century and a half, for the last uh, uh, three bicentennials, we, we see that the wall has been unguarded. And all of, a something, all of a sudden, something that had been missing for 150 years, God gave Nehemiah the ability to rebuild it back in 52 days without bulldozers, without scaffolding, without, uh, without heavy machinery, without equipment, without, without all of the things that we have today uh, and the accoutrements of building, without scissor lifts, uh, without hard hats, uh, without steel toe boots. I need you to understand this. Uh, if you dropped a rock on this foot, it would break. They did not have steel toe boots. So, so without the shin guards and without the elbow pads and, and, and without uh, uh, the, the neon vest and without battery operated machinery, they were able to build a wall four miles long in 52 days. 52 days, 52 days. And, and that's not to include the delays. That's not to include that they could not build on the Saturday because they had to observe the Sabbath and, and there could be no work on the Sabbath. So you got to remove all of the Saturdays in those 52 days. Not to include that the Bible says that Nehemiah had a hammer in one hand and a, a sword in the other. That means that sometimes while he was building, somebody tried to attack. So that means now he's got off days because of the Sabbath and now he's got other delays because of attacks. And then God told me uh, that, that, that I needed to tell you that whenever you're getting ready to build something, you're going to always have two types of delays. You're going to have the service delay and the strike delay. Yeah, because they could not work because they had Saturday service. And the other days they could not work because they were being struck by their enemies. And anytime God calls you to build something, there are two things you're going to have to uh, factor into the mix. Is that there are going to be some days you're going to lose because of service. And there's going to be some days you're going to lose because of strikes. But you got to do it whether you're in service or you got to do it whether you're at strike. No matter what is going on in your life, you got to do it whether you have the ability to or not. God says I'm canceling your weather delays. I'm canceling your excuses. I'm canceling the fact that, that you don't have the money. I'm canceling the fact that somebody's trying to take your job. I'm canceling the fact that somebody's attacking you. I'm canceling the fact that somebody said something about you on social media. I'm canceling the fact that you're waiting on a degree. I'm canceling the fact that you don't have the money. None of that is a reason. I want you to finish this wall. I want you to finish this business. I want you to finish this idea. I want you to finish this company. Whether you have the money or not, whether you're being attacked or not, now, whether you got weather delays, God says, I want you to do it and I want you to do it now. He builds four miles of wall with at least 52 days to do it. And if you add within that, at least seven of those days are gone because of the Sabbath. So now you're down to 45 days. And let's say he was attacked five to ten times. Now he's down to 35 to 40 days. So he really didn't have 52 days to build it. He really had a fraction of that, and he still got it done anyway. And you would think that's such a monumental accomplishment. The next thing that we would see is that the government would be having a parade. And like David, the women would be singing and all of his friends would be clapping for him and the media would be there to cover the story about this guy who was able to build the wall in less than a month and a half. You would think that he would be on the front page of the Jerusalem Post. You would think that somebody would, would be applauding him and applauding him. You would think that his name would be in neon lights. You would think that people would be clapping for him. But the Bible says that after he finished the wall, the next sentence says, and it came to pass that when all of his enemies heard about what he had done and all of the heathens in the vicinity saw these things, they were cast down. No parade, no news coverage, 
No, no magazine articles, no repost on Instagram, no repost on TikTok, no coverage on Snapchat. Nobody creates a post on Facebook. He does his best work at his worst time and he and he feels his worst. And yet he's done it for the city and nobody has anything for him. The Bible says that they were disheartened. They were demoralized. They were defeated. And I want to talk to somebody today because most of us can only work hard when we're celebrated. Most of us can only work hard when we are, when somebody acknowledges us. But let me tell you, you're going to have to build this thing depressed. You're going to have to build it friendless. You're going to have to build it single. You're going to have to build it angry. You're going to have to rejuvenate even when you feel like you're rejected. And the Bible says that he did it anyway. He was not met with celebration. He was met with criticism. What do you do when God has given you something to do and all you hear is critiques? What do you do when you've given your life to something and, and subconsciously you think that when you finish it, somebody's going to say thank you. When you finish it, somebody's going to say congratulations. When you finish it, somebody's going to clap. You, you thought that when you stopped to get those flowers that you were going to walk in the house and your wife was going to be happy. You thought, wife, that if you cooked and, and if you cleaned, that you, would, that you would soothe his demons. What do you do when you've built up the fracture in your relationship only to be met with a criticism and a cold heart? What, what, what do you do when you've given it all you have? I wanted to tell somebody that your biggest opportunity won't be attached to celebration. It will come with criticism. David finally kills Goliath. And the women say, David has killed, uh, Saul has killed his thousands. And David has killed his tens of thousands and the next thing David sees after that applause is a javelin thrown at his head by a man named Saul. Why? Because when you kill your giants, the people who couldn't kill theirs will try to kill you. You better hear what I just said. When you kill your giants, the people who didn't kill theirs will try to kill you. And anytime you kill your giants, listen to me, rejuvenate. Listen to me, WBC 2021. Listen to me. I've got a word for you. Anytime you try to kill your giants and somebody else tries to kill you they have just identified you as a giant don't you hear what you better hear what I just said you better hear what I just said anytime you try to kill your giants and somebody else tries to kill you as a result of you killing your giant what they have just told you is that you are a giant I'm talking to giant business owners I'm talking to giant entrepreneurs who is listening to me I decree and declare by the name of the Holy Ghost that you're going to do giant things somebody shout giant things giant paychecks giant enterprise giant businesses giant ministries giant companies give your neighbor a fist bump and shout I'm a giant. I'm a giant in an apartment. I'm a giant in an efficiency. I'm a giant in this small house. I'm a giant in this car that won't start up. I'm a giant. I'm in a small place but I'm a big thing in a small place. I came to prophesy to giants. I came to preach to giants. I came to encourage giants and came to tell you you got to do it whether you feel giant or not. You got to do it whether you're being fought or whether you're being supported. You got to do it whether they're talking to you or talking about you. You got to do it when you're misunderstood. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me to help somebody. You got to do it when you're frustrated. You got to do it while you're fighting. You got to do it while you're sick. You got to do it while you're hungry. You got to do it when you don't know what to do and haven't done all you can. You got to stand. Somebody shout, do it anyway. You got to do it anyway. You got to do it anyway. And, and let me tell you something. Uh, and, and this is for people uh, who can let people off the hook because sometimes we'll say they, they, they didn't know any better. You remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This ain't the case. They knew who they were messing with. They were not ignorant. They were informed. Because the Bible says, look at verse 16, open your Bible. The Bible says, they perceived that this was the work of the Lord. So what no, what no excuses? 
Wasn't no excuses. Wasn't no, uh, we didn't know that this was God. Was, what was it? Well, it wasn't no, uh, uh, we, we didn't know that this might be him. No, the Bible says that they knew that this was the work of the Lord. And let me tell you something. You better hear me when I tell you this. Watch this. The problem is that, watch this, that he says, and, and having with them having a problem, uh, it, this, this is the thing that, that, that's the issue. They knew it was the work of the Lord, and now they are upset. And this is the first reason why the devil is mad at you is because the hand of God is on you. The hand of God is on you. Now, let, let me put it into context. The problem that I have with them having a problem, the problem that I have with them having an issue, the problem I have with them not having their back is the Bible says that these were heathen people. In other words, these were people who intentionally did not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. See, these are the people. These are the Syrians. These are the Moabites. These are the Samaritans. These are the Amorites. They have all rejected. God and the Bible says that not only did they reject God but they mocked God and now they are mad at God who they rejected because he is now working on the behalf of somebody who accepted him and now they're upset with this man who is building a wall that should take three years to complete but it is now done in 52 days he had the power help me Holy Ghost because he did get because he didn't give God weather delay he had the power because he did it whether he was tired or whether he was frustrated. He showed up when others were showing out. This is the same thing that happens with the Egyptians. They are mad at the Israelites who were slaves, but what they did not know is that they had history with God prior to their slavery. And I don't know who this word is for, but when somebody looks at you in the worst condition of your life and they wonder how you still got it done, tell them I'm not in the right place right now. Now, but I got prior history with God. I used to worship him when I didn't feel like it. I used to tithe when I didn't have the money. So excuse me for being blessed. The reason why I'm blessed is because I chose him even though he chose me. That's the reason why I have a problem with them. They're upset with God because God chose them. But they will not take responsibility for the fact that God gave them the same opportunity and they made a different choice. And don't you ever apologize for being blessed. Don't you apologize for being chosen. Don't you apologize for being set apart. Nehemiah and his people were set apart. The Amorites could have been set apart if they would have worshipped the almighty God. Uh, 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 the Jebusites could have been set apart if they would have worshipped uh, worship the almighty God. But they decided to reject him. And I came to tell somebody right now that your acceptance of God has pushed you further than you ever knew. You did not know that when you called on his name. God had angels surrounding you to make sure that you could reach your destiny in 52 days. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who that word is for. Thank you. I just got a, a word or not. As God told me to tell you that what was supposed to take you two to three years, God says, I have just shrunk it into 50 days. Somebody ought to begin to shout right now because a two to three year project is about to get done in 50 days. Something that you were going to have to wait for for 36 months. God's about to do it in 50 days. I wish I could get somebody to start shouting and jumping right where you are and just start, start shouting 52 days. 50 52 days until the company opens. 52 days until the ministry blows up. I prophesy 52 members every Sunday for the rest of the year. I don't know who that word is for. That word is for some pastor that God's going to send you 52 new members every Sunday for the rest of the year. Not because you're perfect. Not because your preaching is flawless. Not because your praise team is amazing. But you didn't give him weather delays. You preached whether you were happy. You preached whether you were sad. You preached whether you had notes or not. You preached whether you got sleep or not. I need somebody to shout no more weather delays. Hey everybody, it's giving time. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible because it specifically lets me know that if I do A, God will absolutely do B. I believe that this is the season for you to absolutely not to have to worry about money problems. This is the season for you to live in the absolute truth that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. 
I'm believing for you to have a season of overflow. And I want you to connect with us today as we all get ready to give together so that God will be able to open up that window and pour you out a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. All of the instructions on how to do it are coming up on the bottom of the screen right now. This could be the day that changes the rest of your life. If you are faithful over a few things, you read it. God will make you ruler over much. Get ready for much. In fact, I need everybody to type it. Just type much. There you go. I see it coming through there. Say it again, much. Shout it in your house, wherever you are watching this. I want you to believe God for much and more. It is the Father's good pleasure that you would enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. As we go back to this conversation, I want you to go back to this conversation filled with joy, knowing that you're going to hear what we have to say. But I want you to hear that small, still voice whispering in your ear, hearing what the Spirit is saying to you right now. It's your time to live in overflow. Check this out. You better know that the hand of God is on you. Somebody shout the hand of God is on me. I, I want you to shout it. I don't care if we're virtually. I want you to tear the roof off of that place and shout the hand of God is on me. And because the hand of God is on me, that means that everything that's near my hands is near God. I dare you to swing your hand over everything near you. Because if God has you under his hand, that means that everything under your hand is near God. God says, Nehemiah, we're going to build this thing in 52 days. And I don't care what your critics think. I, I, don't, I don't care if the people in the community believe you can do it. I don't care what your haters think. We're going to do this thing in 52 days. And, and watch this. The Bible says, even though the hand of God was on Nehemiah, here it is. It was the hand of God on him that lifted up the heads of the enemy because number two is, is this, whenever the hand of God is on you, the head of the enemy will be looking at you. The Bible says that the men of Judah, the nobles of Judah, all of a sudden started writing letters, complaint letters, and they sent the letters, not to a friend, but to whom the Bible says, Tobiah, whom is a chief enemy of the Jews. You can always tell what reaction your enemies are looking for based on who they send the message to. They were not looking to support him. They were looking to degrade him. God has his hand on him. You can look all through the scripture and find out what the enemy's head does in reaction to what God's hands do. The hand of God gave Joseph a coat of many colors. The heads of his brothers got him in the pit. The Hebrew boys, you remember them? It was obvious that the hand of God was on them, and they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, you can do what you want, but we won't bow. Look at how the hand of God on them lifts up the head of the enemy, and now they find themselves in the fiery furnace because when the hand of God is on you, the head of the enemy will be on you as well. When David was anointed and sent back into the field, it was obviously apparent that the hand of God was on him but now Saul is jealous of him because whenever the hand of God is on you, you can be assured that the head of the enemy will be on you. And so the hand of God is on Nehemiah. And now the fingers of the noblemen of Judah. And I want you to remember for the next few moments, I want you to put this in the corner of your notes and write it down. Just write what happened to the nobles of Judah. The noble men of Judah write a letter to Tobiah, who is a chief enemy of the Jews. Now, before we go any further, they write a letter to Tobiah. And the Bible goes at great length to define to us who Tobiah is. Look, okay, pay attention to me. How many of you all are sometimes tempted? to go on Instagram and write a response to something someone said negative? How many of you ever 
been, a, have you ever, attempt, you, you just sometimes you couldn't help it. Somebody said something in your direct message or, or somebody said something in your church or somebody said something on your job. And when you heard that this person said something, you get upset because now you got to go confront them about what they said. I want, I want you to stop and I want you to pay attention. They wrote letters to Tobiah. And then the Bible defines Tobiah for us. Are you ready? The Bible says in those days, Tobiah was a chief enemy of the Jews who writes the letter, the nobles of Judah. Then the Bible in Nehemiah 3 and 5 starts to define the nobles of Judah. Here's what it says. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 5. Some of the nobles of Judah, Judah were lazy. Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 7. Some of the nobles of Judah were were greedy. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 17, some of the nobles of Judah broke the Sabbath law. You are arguing, frustrated, and angered by lazy, greedy, and non-worshippers. Here you are, about to throw your whole wall project away over a greedy, lazy, non-worshipping individual. And to add injury to insult, according to Nehemiah 6 and 19, you can now add disloyal to the resume. So there are lazy, greedy, disloyal non-worshiping people, I want you to make up in your mind that you will never spend another moment away from your wall because of weather delays. Whether they are lazy, whether they are greedy, whether they are disloyal, whether they are a gossiper, I want you to still keep yourself on the wall. Somebody shout, stay on the wall. You better stay on that wall whether you are dealing with somebody greedy, whether you're dealing with somebody lazy, whether you're dealing with somebody disrespectful, whether you're dealing with somebody distrustful, you better stay on the wall. Somebody shout three times, stay on the wall, stay on the wall, stay on the wall. I'm going to do it no matter what, God. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay on the wall. They, they write a letter. These lazy, greedy, disloyal Non-worshippers, crabs in the bucket, write a letter to Tobiah, one of the fiercest enemies the Jewish people have ever seen. And I'm telling you, it don't matter. It's not, listen, I feel you, Holy Ghost. It's not what the letter says that should get your attention. It don't matter what it says. Their words will not be your benediction. So it doesn't matter what he says. Instead of trying to find out what the letter says, you should be trying to figure out why they wrote it. Why did the nobles of Judah write a letter to Tobiah in opposition to Nehemiah's work? Why would somebody go into the supervisor's office and snitch on you? Why would somebody Talk bad about somebody like you. After all, you're just trying to build your wall. Why in the world would they say something about you? Here it is. Nehemiah 6 and 19 sums it up. Are you ready? It says, and Tobiah sent letters to put fear in me. Good God Almighty. Oh, my God. I hope this is helping somebody. He says, and he put the letters out to put fear in me. Let me just slow down and tell you this right now. 
The enemy knows if he can make you afraid, he can stop your progress. And the Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and that of a sound mind. They wanted Nehemiah afraid because they know that whenever a person is afraid, they will leave their assignment. There is a show that's on television right now called Neighbor, Neighborhood Wars. And in the show Neighborhood Wars, because now everybody has a ring camera and everybody's got these cameras on their home. So now they have a show where they have a compilation of all of these things that happened in neighborhoods during the season of COVID. And, 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 and it tells, I saw one story where a dog came running after a man who was holding the hand of his child. And, and the meme goes on to say uh, that African-American people will leave anything behind when a dog is coming. And so they're on the porch with the children, and here's this big old father who's on the porch with his children, and the dog came running across the street, and because he was afraid, he ran in the house and left his baby on the porch Worse than a dog is a roaring lion. And that's why the devil keeps charging at you because he understands that whenever he comes running, you'll leave that which you assigned to to go and protect yourself. That's why he wants you afraid. That's why he wants you afraid to open up that business. He wants you afraid to open up that ministry. He wants you afraid to take the next step. He wants you afraid to go back to school because if you think about going back to school, you'll start thinking about all of the things that won't happen if you go back to school and how tired you'll be and, and what you won't be able to do. So he wants you afraid. And when he has you afraid, it's called paralysis by analysis. You'll be trying to figure out what to do. You'll be like a deer in the headlight and you will get hit by the car because you did not have the wherewithal to know what direction to flee. Because sometimes when you get afraid, you stand still. That's what I believe happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve was walking around and the Lord says, Adam, where art thou? And he, he froze in fear because fear will make you stand still. Still will give you weather delays. <laughs> I hope you're getting this. Fear. You see, Pastor Festus had to get over fear to do this conference. And, and he did the conference in a pandemic virtually and called preachers and prophets and evangelists all over the nation to speak to you. Not worrying about what if it didn't work? What if nobody logs on? What if nobody comes? In this season, God is looking for leaders who won't have weather delays. Who will do it. Not only do it, but do it in a time frame that nobody expects. Somebody shout, I won't be afraid. Let me finish it up. God's hand is on you. The enemy's head is looking at you. But lastly, God gives Nehemiah the ability to transform his habitat. Watch this. His environment. The completion of the wall did not end Nehemiah's work. In fact, the completion of the wall was essential to the beginning of his work. Because God did not call Nehemiah to be a carpenter. His story doesn't end here. If, if him building the wall was all that God had for him, then the scripture would say, man, nobody worked a hammer and a chisel like Nehemiah, and nobody could shape a stone like Nehemiah. And, and, but the Bible doesn't tell us anything about his carpentry work because God used carpentry to do something else. He used carpentry to do Something else, once the wall is completed, here it is. The people appoint Nehemiah as the next governor over Judah. <laughs> this 
wasn't about building a wall. This was about shifting politics. This wasn't about a fence. This was about God setting up somebody he trusted in authority. Help me, Holy Ghost. It, it ain't about what you're going through. It's about what God has taken you to. Nehemiah was humble enough to be a carpenter, but wise enough to be a governor. And now he's the governor over the province of Judah. And now Nehemiah has the ability to set up structure and has the ability to set up authority. And watch this. I'm getting ready to shout for you. When the walls were built, the Bible says that Nehemiah put porters and singers and Levites at the temple door. I wish I was in New York with y'all. Oh, Lord, I wish I was there with you. I wish I was in New York with you because I can't halfway take it. I'm about to run. I'm in here all by myself, so I'm telling you right now, you're going to have to bear with me because I get excited about the word of God. When the wall was finished, he didn't finish it with a paint job. He didn't finish it with lacquer. He dressed it with porters, singers, and Levites. Now, you know Levites were those individuals who assisted the priest in the temple. Oh, I feel like shouting right now. Somebody at WBC, you better get, you better get ready because this is your shouting moment. Because when he finished the wall, he put porters and singers and Levites at the temple doors. Why? Because these were people who were acquainted with temples. So the only people that Nehemiah, help me Holy Ghost, trusted with his wall was somebody that God could trust with worship. Oh, God, help me. God said, or Nehemiah rather says, I am not putting anybody at the doors of my wall who does not understand how to worship God. Are you here with me today? He says the people he trusted with the wall were people who could be trusted with worship. And God is trying to tell me to tell you that the people that you have at the gates of your life, you need worshipers at your ear gate. You need worshipers at your eye gate. You need worshipers at your mouth gate. You need worshipers at your heart gate. Stop trusting people who just got money and find you somebody who got a prayer life. Just stop, stop trusting people who got degrees and somebody who knows how to worship. Nehemiah says, I'm not just going to put anybody at my doors. I'm going to trust people with my entrances that I can trust with an expression. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm going to trust my wall to worshipers. Make sure, Pastor, that when you're hiring your secretary, that you peep over and see if she's worshiping in church. Pastor, the next time you hire a praise team singer, Make sure they don't just worship when they got a solo. Make sure they worship when somebody else is singing. The next time you look for an assistant pastor, don't just look for somebody who has the ability to administrate. You need to find somebody who will dance and cut a rug and tear up the carpet. Why? Because worshipers understand things that builders don't. Nehemiah said, you going to stand guard at my door? You better know how to worship him. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm going to give you about 13 seconds to worship God right now. That's right. I dare you to worship him until the walls of Jericho fall down and worship until the walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt again. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's a rebuilding coming to your life. There's a regeneration coming to your life. There's a resurgence coming to your life. In spite of the rejection, God is going to make the rejected stone the chief cornerstone you got five more seconds to lift up a worship and begin to give God some praise. Can I finish with this? Nehemiah says, you can't stand at my door unless you worship. I can't wait until I start going in churches and, and, and see the ushers worshiping. To see 
the deacons worshiping and, 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 and not just preachers who sit back and watch other preachers, but preachers who worship when it's somebody else's assignment. He says, you can't watch my walls if I can't trust you with worship. Oh, and by the way, I got two positions I'm getting ready to give out. Because you didn't understand in the beginning why I told you to write the nobles of Judah in the top corner of your paper. Because now Nehemiah can bless somebody. And the Bible says that he blessed two men who so happened to be faithful men, who so happened to be his brothers, Hananiah and Hananiah. And the Bible says that he gave them the job over the palace. Ooh, Jesus. Because sometimes you may not have the money to buy a palace, but if you got the right relationships, God will send somebody to put you in one. And now his brothers are in a palace they don't have to pay for. They're in a palace they don't have to worry about cleaning. They're in a palace that they don't have to watch over. They got palace grace, but not palace bills. And now Hananiah and Hananiah are over the palace. And I said, I wanted you to write down the names of the nobles of Judah because the nobles of Judah who were already noble in the city had they picked Nehemiah before he was governor Nehemiah could have picked them after he became governor but because they made the wrong choice of writing letters to his enemies they forfeited their right to be picked when it was time for God to give out positions I don't know who I'm talking to I don't know who this is for, but God told me to tell you that you don't have to worry about your enemies. They will recognize that they picked wrong by picking a fight with you because God is about to raise you up. And had they been on your side in the beginning, they could be on your side in the end. Nobody knew that Joseph was going to be second in command in Pharaoh's house. And there were people who threw him in the pit. And thank God he had enough grace to feed his brothers in the famine. I don't know who I'm talking to but there is a Joseph anointing coming over your life that God is going to give you an opportunity to feed people who fed you to the wolves the nobles they picked wrong they thought all Nehemiah was was a carpenter they didn't know they had turned over a governor nobody knows the anointing and glory that God has on your life nobody knows that you're going to be bigger than you are right now nobody knows that you have more power than you expressing right now oh you better understand that God is about to do major things with you and you ain't a governor right now and you're not a business owner right now and you don't have a mega church right now and you don't have millions of dollars right now but one thing you do have is no weather delays and as long as you keep showing up God is going to keep showing up WBC 2021 God is he's looking to use you he's looking Christian life he's, 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 he's looking to use you. I don't know who that word was for. But you got to do it whether you feel like it or not. You got to do it whether it's the Sabbath or whether it's a strike. You got to do it when all of your enemies are planning an attack at the same time. But you're going to have to be cautious. Because not many people will follow a carpenter around. But when you become governor, all of a sudden you find out who you're related to. When your church is out of that storefront and God puts you on 100 acres, all them pastors in your town that used to didn't talk to you, they'll be inviting you to the meeting. Oh, it's going to turn around for you. I was young and now I'm old. One thing I know, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. It's going to turn around for you. Nehemiah builds that, that wall. I'm done. And he builds that wall. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that he gives instructions to the men at the gates. The Bible says, Nehemiah said, and I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun be hot. 
let not the gates of Jerusalem open until the sun be hot. He says, I, I want you to understand that the gates would normally open in the early part of the day. And as soon as it was like, it's like Wall Street. The bell rings early and everybody rushes into the city. He said, hold on, we're going to wait. We're going to wait until it's hot. Because when you open those doors, not only the people who mean the city well will come in, but the enemies will come in as well. And you, and you got to understand that your enemies are earnest. They, they are antsy. They, 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 they can't wait to turn you. They can't wait to destroy you. They can't wait to knock down your wall. So he said, we're going to wait a little bit. We're going we're gonna to pause just a second before we open the gates. Then the Lord told me to tell you that when you become governor, you have to exercise extra caution about who you open up to. That's a word for somebody. I know you're kind and, and, and as a minister, you're open hearted. And as an evangelist, you love everybody and you want to help the world and you want to feed the poor. Fine, I get it. But there comes a time in your life where you have to be careful who you open up to. Sometimes you're going to have to keep your ear gate closed just a little longer. Sometimes you're going to have to keep your eye gate closed just a a little longer. You, you're going to have to make that person who, you, who you're thinking about appointing to a higher position. You may have to wait just a little longer. This is the season for you to be a little more cautious about who you open up to. I speak over your life right now in the name of Jesus. That in this setting that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. And that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And in the day of trouble, he will hide you in the secret place. I speak provision over your life. The anointing of God. Is currently destroying yokes. Be not weary in your well doing. You will reap a harvest if you faint not. I prophesy millions of dollars into your account. That's for an entrepreneur. I, I prophesy thousands of members into your ministry. That's for a pastor. I pray. For a million dollar idea, that's for an inventor. I pray, I pray a resurgence over your business, that's for a dreamer. And I pray that God will do all things well. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. What's up guys? We thank you so much for watching this message. Be sure if you haven't already, check out the box below and these are instructions on how to give. Also, if you just don't know where to go, where to turn, who to turn to, if you feel connected to this church, if you feel connected to our pastor in this ministry, be sure to also look down below on how to connect with us and to just join us every single time that you see us on Sundays or Tuesdays, whatever worship service that we may have. And I also want to take this thing out with a prayer for you guys. We pray that this word penetrates your heart. May the blood of Jesus be with you all the days of your life. Everywhere your feet shall tread, he will be with you. We thank you again for watching us and y'all have a good day. Hey everybody, what's going on? It's PK here. And listen, I want to tell you that I get so many DMs, so many messages of people saying, Pastor, how can I connect with you? I love your messages, but going through YouTube is kind of difficult. Where can I come to a centralized place? We heard you, and that's why we created Lighthouse 2.0. Lighthouse 2.0 is our tribe. It's our village. It's the place where all of the people who say, I want PK to be my online pastor, and PK says, I want you to be my online member. This is the place where we go, the watering hole, the ecosystem, where we all come to grow together, and it is exclusively 
for you. They're getting ready to put a link up on the screen right now that shows you how you make that exclusive step. And everybody can't get in. So you better take first mover's advantage and get in while you can fit in. I can't wait to see you inside of 2.0. May God bless you and let's do this thing for Christ.